Okay, we'll just dim the lights so that you can have a nice little snooze up there. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. This presentation is pretty raw since I only just threw it all together. It's not as well developed as Al Gracie's presentation on the flopped classroom model, but we're going to talk about flipped classrooms today. And before I begin, I would like to acknowledge my co-investigator, Dr Johnny Fay, from the Australian Maritime College, who actually has a much larger grant working on ECHO 360 currently in progress, and he very kindly agreed to be my co-investigator on this particular project. So, before I start, think back to when you were a university student. How were your lectures delivered? If you're somebody like me, it was in that pretty traditional didactic style of lecturing where the lecturer stood up the front and talked at you. They were the sage on the stage. You all had textbooks and if you really wanted to get that specific information, you had to go to the library and get things from the reserve section. The internet was in its infancy, computers were for the privileged and if you missed a lecture that was the end of the world because you had to hope that your classmates took some really, really good notes. So that was the way that it was and it worked and it seemed to work just fine. But that education system I just described is actually probably no longer uh, appropriate. Today's students are quite different. They're no longer the people that our educational system was designed to teach. And our students today are all native speakers of the digital language of computers, video games and the internet. And Mark Prinsky has um, coined this term digital natives to describe our students of today. So what characterises these digita digital natives? Who here was born after 1990? Are you lying, Steve? <laughs> Steve lying. Okay. Digital natives are those that were born after 1990 and they actually view uh, technology as a necessity. Over 75% of them use computers as their major form of communication. If they're emailing, Skyping, Facebooking, they're dependent on technology. Everyone has a smartphone, an iPad, an iPod, a tablet, a PVR at home. They're often quite creative and expressive, you know, they LOL and RFOL and they're busy OMGing and WTF. And they're not just dependent on um, technology, they're actually engrossed in it. Usually you can walk around one of your lecture theatres if you're of the roaming kind, as Bob is, and you will see them sitting there. Al Gracie texting you, trying to catch you out in the middle of a, of a lecture. So they're on it all the, all the time. They're actually quite happy to experiment with um, information and communication technology and they're pretty good at picking up new skills, but they tend to be less structured in their learning and educators need to be very wary of this generation of students in their classroom and perhaps modify their teaching style um, to adapt to this. So these digital natives, they often prefer graphics before text. They don't want that traditional lecture style dissemination um, of in information. So flipped or inverted classrooms are seen as a bit of a solution to this. So flipped or inverted classrooms use digital technology, usually in the form of pre-recorded lectures, to free up some class time from lecture content and assigning students instructional content before they actually come to the class. So it's homework in preparation um, for class. And so thus they sort of usually end up blending online and in-class learning. This is just a nice little schematic that sort of shows you what I mean. So in that traditional um, model, the classroom time is jam-packed with teacher instruction, students' assimilation of that instruction, and then completing an activity to hopefully reinforce that assimilation. And then they go home and do the homework to consolidate what they've learnt, but they're doing that in isolation. But when you flip it around, the flip model of instruction, um, flip classroom model, sorry, has more instruction and assimilation done before the class, which means there's more time actually in the class to do the activities to consolidate their learning, and they've also got more time to get teacher support. So why would you flip a classroom? There are numerous uh, purported benefits up there. I stole this slide from that website up the, so up the top because I quite like it. So students can do things in their own time, at their own place, because they're prepared, prepared for class. They can come ready for um, you know, discussion or ask deeper and more meaningful questions. If they're absent for any reason, then they've got a resource that can help them stay up to date. They're more likely to engage in peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and interact with each other, and in some cases they'll actually guide them. They can keep going over content that they're struggling with. By being prepared, as I've already said, there's more class time to actually do the tasks that they need to do. If there's more time, then the students can benefit from more individualised mentoring from staff. 
If you use digital technology to create a resource, then this resource can be used by other members in your teaching team and very, very handy in case you, you actually happen to be absent. And you also can get some gains in teaching efficiency if you happen to deliver the same class multiple times or if you want to use content from year to year. Having listed a whole lot of positives, though, there are a couple of negatives. It's heavily reliant on students being able to access technology. The educators need to be quite good at uh, utilising the technology. And you might need to have some more than expected preparation time and you might actually need to keep revisiting your content as you try to maintain currency of information. So how did I flip my microbiology classrooms? So just a bit of a background about the student cohort that I teach. So there's about 100 students in this class and it's a code share between three different uh, microbiology units. There are about 20 in KLA 200 Microbiology Marine and the rest are in um, the microbiology unit, but they're taught together most of the time. There's three lab sessions a week for 13 weeks. The reason that we have to have three lab sessions is because we're limited by the number of seats in our class. So I definitely have to teach the same lab class three times a week. Occasionally, if the numbers in one of the units spill over 86, then we actually have to teach a fourth class. So I'm delivering the same content four times a week. They're pretty full on. There's 80% attendance required uh, in class. So weeks one to 11, they do their project-based work. Week 12, they get an opportunity to revise for the practical exam and then in week 13 they actually have their practical exam which is a big deal because it's worth 20% of their overall grade and they just finished those yesterday and today. So the lab classes, as I've said, they're pretty full on. They've got quite a hefty laboratory manual which contains um, a lot of detailed intro introductory material and procedures that they need to follow in order to complete the tasks. Students are expected to be prepared for the laboratory classes. We ask them to make sure that they read the relevant projects for the week. We wish they would read the relevant projects for the week. To try to make them read the relevant projects for the week, we do have some weekly assessment tasks that we actually align fairly strongly to those activities. I have yet to resort to the tactic of saying what is the spelling mistake on page 41 to try to get them to read the manual. And then I would do an in-class introduction to give them some supplementary information or extra tips for that particular class and I would do that in the class prior to this year. So that introductory lecture, it could take about 20 to 30 minutes at the start of each lab class. Um, I've now advanced from Tom McMeekin's scribbling on blackboards through to PowerPoint presentations that contain a lot of text, images, video files, you know, trying to sort of appeal to all the different learners in the room. And after I would have gone through that introductory lecture, then I leave the slides on a rolling presentation so it's always there for them in class if they need to refer to it. Sometimes I'll, I might switch between what's going on in the PowerPoint presentation with a live uh, video camera if I need to demonstrate any particular uh, techniques or occasionally with our high definition microscope with a camera on it. So that's how uh, I used to do it. So what this project about is actually leveraging that existing content and converting some of those introductory lectures from that in-class delivery style into this flipped classroom learning model, so turning them into pre-recorded um, lectures. Do this using Echo360 personal capture software. So for those of you who have lectured in lecture theatres like this one, the um, automatic voice recording and capture of your slides that you can do in this, le um, this lecture theatre. You can actually do that on your desktop with this software. You can even sit there with a little uh, microphone um, headset on and record them that way. Or you can actually use a wireless recorder if you want to use the same software while you're actually walking around in your laboratory class. So with this project, because of the way the unit is um, structured, of the um, 11 weeks of teaching, there are eight weeks that I teach, this bacteriology uh, unit, and then there's three weeks where they um, sort of divide off into their specialist areas of activity with marine or medical microbiology. And so because I teach one block, I went and converted most of those introductory lectures into this um, flipped classroom model, and the specialist block remained with the traditional delivery style, so um, the lecturers standing up at the front of the class, um, taking up time in the class to do their introduction. You'll note on here, though, that the first week uh, we remain as an in-class introduction. That's because there's quite a significant degree of um, safety content in that uh, particular class, and we wouldn't want to rely on students having viewing that before walking in and getting a bit gung-ho with some of the stuff that they're doing. 
So I got those existing PowerPoints, I sort of updated them, uh, some of the movie files, thanks to my beautiful assistant Laurie up there, filmed her doing um, a few things. They were previously done live, but I've now got them all as nice little video files. I put a lot of links into YouTube videos so that they can get some um, extra information on generic techniques. The presentations were captured so that you got the slides and the audio, but I still made sure that the slides were available to them in class. I uploaded them onto Milo five days before each class so the students could access them. I could go in and download the usage statistics weekly and also uh, I'm going to survey students and teaching staff to see what they thought of it. So there is some quantitative data that you can ca um, access through ECHO 360 so, and you can do this obviously with the ones that are recorded in these lecture theatres. So you can get some summary information like this screenshot here. So for that particular introductory lecture week six, I had 54 of the 100 students went and looked at it. There were 85 cumulative views, so some of them were going back in and looking at it. The average completion time was only 65%. You can link discussion topics to these if you want to, but it also gives you a usage heat map, so you can see where there are any hot spots in those presentations. These are the areas which are either really, really interesting or they're really, really tricky and they're having to go back and review that information. This is a very uh, quick and dirty graph that I just sort of uh, made today that's showing that in the blue, uh, this is the number of unique viewers immediately prior to the class. So this is when they are definitely using these as preparation for the class. And you can see anywhere from about 50 to 60% to of the students, because there are 100 students, are actually accessing those introductory lectures. So I guess that's good. They had their PRAC exam this week and so I went and downloaded those numbers again to see whether there was an increase in uh, accessing those introductory lectures as if they were using them to revise for the practical exam and you can only see that there were five or six more uh, students that actually went in and accessed them for revision purposes which surprised me. The reason I've blocked out weeks uh, 8A or 8B is that we actually made two recordings. One of them was uh, reviewing content from week seven and the other one was an assessment task that Shane Powell does. So I'm kind of not, they're sort of not the same uh, style as weeks two uh, to seven. But what is interesting is that um, because that comes just before Easter, if you look at week 8A, hardly anybody went and looked at that um, particular introductory lecture, but by the end of the semester they had gone back and had a bit of a look at it. Maybe they had some more time or maybe they thought they'd better revise that one for the practical exam. To try to encourage them to do it, um, they were told that, there was a, um, that we were doing this style of delivery. Everybody got the same handout, so it wasn't like you had to actually access technology in order to find out that you needed to access technology. You did get a paper uh, handout. I reminded them again um, that same week with a news item, again in week five, again in week seven, and you can see it actually didn't make any difference to the usage statistics, so I think they're either going to do it or they're not going to do it. You can also uh, access uh, far more detailed information, so you can access a, a spreadsheet that gives you aggregate information which will show you the number of unique views, the cumulative views, average completion uh, for each of the um, lectures. I'm not actually sure what this data is going to tell me yet because I've only just downloaded it, but Leah Chandler is really helpful, part of the My Media team, who, can help, uh, who will help me work out what this all means. There's another set of data that you can go um, and have a look at which is specific for students. So I've blocked out um, a student there, but that's a student in blue, that's a student in yellow, that's a student in red, and so on down there. And you can see that the student in blue actually didn't bother to go and look at them um, at all. Uh, Oh, except for uh, the tutorial that was di directly linked to an assignment. Um, the student in yellow has gone and accessed most of those uh, introductory lectures. So this information could be quite useful if you wanted to track down students who aren't using your introductory lectures. I can go in and find out who they are and I could probably send them a little reminder email. So as a scientist, I'm quite happy with that quantitative style of data and then we move into the qualitative style of data, which I'm not at all used to, with our surveys. So we are surveying our students. Uh, we've got a, a survey that they're doing right now that has a range of um, question styles in there, ones where they just select the answer, some Likert scale and an open-ended question so they can really tell us what they thought of these lectures. And also the staff that are involved in that um, activity will either become part of a focus group or they might get a staff survey or interview to see what the staff thought of it. Um, you know, did they change their behaviour in the class because of these 
um, introductory lectures being pre-recorded, can they tell me about any benefits or perceived uh, disadvantages of using this technique? So the student survey focuses a bit on the where, the you know, when, what device, because obviously access to um, digital technology or technology in general is going to be uh, of concern to us, so they'll be able to tell us about that. And as well, we've got um, the big Likert scale question where they can um, tell us whether they really found the Echo 360 uh, beneficial um, or not. So some of those questions are on there, you know, does it help me with language differences? Does it help in clarifying topics? I think it's going to help me get a higher grade. It assists in my preparation for the laboratory class, um, etc. So how do you get students to do a survey at this time of the year where every student's received 5,000 evaluate surveys, asking them to you know, respond on what they thought of their unit, what they thought of their teaching staff. Now I'm asking them to do a survey. So I tried to incentivise them with some um, vouchers. Um, I sort of then posed the question to them. I did a bit of a presentation to them last week saying what could a $20 supermarket voucher uh, get you to try and get them excited. I was pretty excited that it could buy me 20 ice creams if I happened to win one of those vouchers. And um, as of last week, I've got 51 out of the 100 students to respond. So bribery seems to be quite um, effective. So in terms of um, what do I think about the flipped microbiology lab lectures based on that previous slide, um, look, I would have thought pace would be an obvious um, benefit to them. They can go through it at their, at their own pace, but again, I'll have to wait to sort of, I guess, get a bit more information from the students. Preparedness, an absolutely huge tick from me. I have seen students coming into my lab classes, not with blank laboratory manuals, but manuals that have got highlighted sections like this one. They've got you know, notes written all over them. I've even seen the clever students doing screen captures of each of the slides on the introductory lectures and bringing those in. Um, help students who are absent stay current. I kind of think that this is a bit of a yin and yang. There's a bit of a positive and a negative. Yes, I can see that could help them stay current, but could it actually make them um, a little bit more inclined to be absent. I would hope not in this unit because we've got an 80 per cent attendance requirement and I certainly haven't noticed any differences. So maybe that one's a, a, a positive. So from the usage statistics, it's indicating that about 50 to 60 per cent of the students are actually accessing these um, lectures and they sit in benches of four, so I hypothesise that at least two out of the four have probably accessed this and um, that means that they're going to help their peers and I've definitely seen evidence of this um, in class. Look, if you don't get it the first time, you can go back. I don't know whether that's actually true. I'll have to wait for the results from the student survey. More time in class, absolute big tick from, from me. The classes are much calmer. They're getting out 30 minutes earlier. Our preparation staff who are sitting here in the room with us um, actually know that they're going to get out of there at one o'clock so they can get in and set up the, um, the next class. And of course, um, there's more time for us to actually go on and engage with these students and um, ask, assist them when they ask those deeper style of questions. Is it a good uh, resource for teacher assistance? I think so, but I'll have to ask my um, teaching team whether they uh, think it's so. Uh, efficiency, yep, I have to talk um, less, so I think that's uh, pretty good. Computer access, I'm not gonna know until the student surveys actually come in. So, you know, of the 40 to 50% who aren't accessing it, why? Is it because they don't have the internet at home? I don't know at this stage. Preparation time, I think that there are positives and negatives um, to this. It took a lot longer than what I thought to do the first one. I think I was in here for like five hours on a Sunday to get a 30 minute one. Um, but that's partly because you've got to make um, that decision about how you're going to deliver, deliver these introductory lectures. Are you going to go for a presentation like I'm doing now where I've probably said um 25 times and stumbled over words? Or am I going to go for a perfectly scripted, flawlessly delivered presentation? If I'm going to do that one, then it's going to take me a lot long, longer to do that particular uh, presentation time. And maintaining currency of content, I'll refer to that um, in a minute. So I think there's some positive and negatives there. Just to summarise the things I really liked, definitely more time in class for students to complete those lag, lab exercises. I definitely saw more engagement with the written material. It's the written technical um, procedures that these digital natives don't want to uh, engage with at all. Um, we've had some frustrating times in there with Bunsen burners and people not actually having the hands-on skills to light Bunsen burners without blowing themselves up or destroying a $1,500 microscope. And I swear if I had an app for it, they'd be great at lighting Bunsen burners. So it is a, um, the sort of the practical skills and engaging with those written notes that they struggle with. 
I've mentioned the increase in peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. It was really great to watch. We had more time to um, talk to the students and um, just from talking to the teaching team, there was a definite decrease in those procedural based questions. How many mils of this am I adding to that? They didn't ask those types of questions. They were actually more interested in engaging with you and asking about the study based questions at the end of each um, project. Opportunity for revision. I thought it would be a good opportunity for revision, but then my previous data shows that they weren't really going back to it. But I'll be quite interested to see if I can correlate um, an improved performance in the practical exam because of the change in delivery here. The potential concerns, the first class, and I think Shane can probably attest to this, I was just a nervous wreck in that class the first time they'd done the introductory lectures because I didn't know how many of them had, had actually um, accessed it. And even though I'd already done the safety presentation in the first lecture, I still felt really, really nervous because I was relying on them doing their homework. So there was a bit of um, teacher anxiety. Uh, in microbiology, we work with live and incubating cultures and things change. Things grow one week and then they don't want to grow the next week. We might need to change a procedure. So that means that can I really use that archived material that well? You have to speak way more slowly than uh, expected. There's no way I could talk at the speed I'm talking now. I found with the voice recording you've really got to slow it um, down. And I mentioned about whether you want to make that um, decision for ad hoc delivery or are you going to script it. Student access to technology, a bit worried about that, but the survey will let me know. The technology can let you down. I thought I recorded a 30-minute flawless lecture only to find that the microphone decided not to work. It doesn't happen too often, but it can happen. And again, feedback is reliant on surveys, and I'm a little bit concerned about um, survey fatigue, certainly with our students, but as we're sort of pushed to move into this space of um, publishing in these areas, a lot of the way that the only way that we're really going to get that qualitative feedback is through surveying students. Things I'd do differently, take the dates off the slides and refer to deadlines more generically, just on the off chance that I could use the same presentation next year and save myself a bit of time. Don't just press start and go. I'm pretty certain I knew what I was doing and off I'd go and um, just do one. I really probably should have practiced using the software first and learnt to use the editing tool because that probably could have saved me from actually doing a few repeated lectures. Um, when you go through this, um, the statistics, which I haven't shown you, it does seem that completion rate of viewing an introductory lecture is a problem. There aren't that many students that go the whole way through, so I need to come up with some tra strategies to try and encourage them to go the whole way um, through. So maybe I could put some different things about assessment tasks in there. There's repeated safety information we put in there that's often at the end. I need to mix it up where I'm going to... Um, put that. And now that I know that I can actually um, get that specific student information about usage, then maybe I need to, in week two, be emailing those students that didn't access it and asking them why they're not um, accessing it. So I think you can flip a laboratory class. Probably what I didn't mention is that flipped classrooms are generally more about that lecture style, tutorial style uh, of delivery, not so much these hands-on laboratory classes. I definitely think it can benefit teachers. I feel, um, I feel pretty good about it. Does it benefit students? Look, I think it does, based on what I've seen, but I've also got to wait for the student opinion on that, and I need to implement some um, strategies to increase adoption, so actually getting them to view those lectures and viewing an entire lecture, not just a part of it. And I think that the flipped classroom, probably its most valuable uh, thing is in changing that role from being a sage on the stage to more of a guide on the side. So their, you know, their learning is much more central to the process than your teaching actually is. So thank you for your time. And I don't know if anyone's got questions.